let's start with the fact that doesn't really seem to sit very well. And that is, well, if we randomly choose a number x between one and four, and then expand the square root of x in its decimal expansion, and look at the third decimal point, or the third number past the decimal point, this digit happens to be more likely to be the number seven than the number two. In fact, as those digits get larger, the likelihood of this digit being equal to that number increases. So it's least likely to be zero, it's a little bit more likely to be one, and a little bit more likely to be two, but in fact it's most likely to be nine. Now that seems like a crazy thing that happens, but it in fact is true. And that, along with a more general result, is something that I found in an article from 1984 in the College Math Journal. And we're going to look at part of that result today. And so let's maybe sharpen this into a question, and that is, given x between n squared and n plus 1 squared, so those are consecutive perfect squares, What's the probability that the rth digit in the decimal expansion of the square root of x is k? And for notational convenience, we'll say that that rth digit is d sub r. So let's look at the idea for our solution or our construction of our proof. And that is, well, we're going to take an x between those consecutive perfect squares, n squared and n plus 1 squared. And then we're going to partition this interval into pieces. And I've labeled those pieces as just the whole interval, which is in white chalk, and this yellow subinterval, which is in yellow chalk. And, well, the yellow subintervals are the places where that rth digit is k. And then, well, if we can get a handle on all of those subintervals where the rth digit is equal to k, then the probability that we have the rth digit is equal to k is equal to the length of all of those subintervals added up over the length of the entire interval. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of what this problem is, as well as our outline, let's see how we can approach it more carefully. And we're going to start by setting, well, I'm going to use this notation b of d sub r comma k, and that's the notation used in this paper, but this notation is meant to be, well, all of these yellow subintervals. So let's write that down carefully. So this is going to be the set of all x between n squared and n plus 1 squared, such that the square root of x is equal to, well, it's going to be n point d1, d2, all the way down dr minus 1, and then k, and then dr plus 1, dot, dot, dot. Great. And notice right there I've put a k in the rth digit, so that's how I've got that going on there. And now, well, let's observe the following fact that we have x inside of b, d, r, k, if and only if we have the square root of x equal to n point d1, d2, all the way down, dr minus 1, k, dr plus 1, and then so on and so forth. So that's just a rewriting of the condition of the set. Okay, but now what I'd like to do is maybe turn that into an inequality. So the inequality goes like this. I'm going to put the square root of x in the middle, and then to the left of that, I'll truncate this by throwing away all of the digits past the rth digit. And that's going to give us, well, a non-strict inequality, because perhaps the square root of x could end at that rth digit. So here we would have n point d1 all the way down dr minus 1 k. And then, well, I'm going to bound it above by, well, what would happen if the rth digit was k plus 1, and then it ended. But in this case, we get a strict inequality. So here we have n dot d1 all the way down dr minus 1, and then I'll put k plus 1 in parentheses. Okay, so we've got something like that. But now I'm going to scale this a little bit so I only have one point past the decimal point. 
So to do that, I'm going to multiply by 10 to the r minus 1. And that's going to give me 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus, well, this number, which is d1 to dr minus 1, I'm going to put a bar over it. But that's going to be, well, notice that that's an integer. And then I'll have plus k over 10. So that's going to be less than or equal to 10 to the r minus 1 times root x, which in turn is less than or equal to 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus d1 all the way down dr minus 1. I'll put a bar over it again, plus k plus 1 over 10. But then I'm going to take this, this d1 to dr minus 1, which appears in both sides of this inequality. And I'm just going to say that this is p, which is some integer from a certain set which we can get a handle on. And that's the set 0, 1, all the way up to 10 to the r minus 1 minus 1, which is, of course, like just a string of nines. And well, this is going to be the same p over here. So that's kind of nice because that's a discrete number of possible values of this p. Okay, so next up what we'll do is square all parts of this inequality to get rid of the square root of x part. So that'll leave us with, so over here on the left, we'll have 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k over 10 quantity squared less than or equal to 10 to the 2r minus 2 times x which in turn is less than or equal to 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k plus 1 over 10 all squared. So we've got something like that. But now let's put this in terms of some subinterval. So this is if and only if x is in the following subinterval. So it's going to be bound below by this 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k over 10 quantity squared all over 10 to the 2r minus 2. And it's going to be bound above by 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k plus 1 over 10 all squared. Again, all over 10 to the 2r minus 2. Now we include the lower end point, but not the other, the upper end point. And I guess I should say this is uh, for sum p from that set of integers 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 10 to the r minus 1 minus 1. So this is like a description of these subintervals that we described over here that are maybe what we would call the good subintervals. Okay, nice. So let's maybe bring that information up and then we'll keep going. Okay, so on the last board, well, we found an explicit description of these subintervals where dr was equal to k. And, well, dr is equal to k in the expansion of the square root of x, if and only if x is in one of these complicated subintervals. So that means that we can just go ahead and do this probability calculation immediately. So let's do here, the probability that dr is equal to k will be equal to, well, it's going to be the length of all of these subintervals, well, the sum of the lengths of those subintervals over the length of the entire interval. So notice that the length of the entire interval can be simplified. Here we have n plus 1 squared minus n squared. Well, that's clearly going to be 2n plus 1 in the denominator. So here I'm going to write this as 1 over 2n plus 1. And then after that, we've got the sum of all of these subintervals, or I should say the length of all of those subintervals. But observe that those are indexed by this integer that was described before this p. So this is going to be the sum as p goes from 0 to 10 to the r minus 1 minus 1 because those were all the allowable values of p. And then from there, we're going to simply subtract the end point of the subinterval minus the starting point of the subinterval. So that's going to leave us a 1 over 10 to the 2r minus 2. So that's in the end point as well as the starting point. 
And then we'll have 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k over 10 squared minus, we've got this 10 to the r minus 1 times n plus p plus k plus 1 over 10 quantity squared. Okay, and then this seems like it might be a little tricky to work with, but in fact, we can use a nice mathematical trick of factorization to simplify it easily. Observe that here we've got a difference of squares. So we've got this first term squared minus this second term squared, and I'm gonna underline these in pink. So by the difference of squares formula, well, if you think about how a squared minus b squared factors as a minus b times a plus b, well, that's exactly how this will factor as well. And then if we take the difference of those two, we get a lot of nice simplification. Okay, so let's bring that down. So we have this one over, I'm gonna write this as 10 to the two r minus two times two n plus one. And then I have my sum, which is p going from zero to 10 to the r minus one minus one. And then I've got the difference of those two terms, which observe that the first and second term cancel when we take that difference. And then we simply have k plus one over 10 minus k over 10, that gives us one over 10. But we can combine that with this 10 to the two r minus two to make it a 10 to the two r minus one. So that's a nice simplification. And then inside of the sum, we simply have the sum of those two terms. So we'll have a two times 10 to the r minus one times n, and then plus a two times p, and then finally, a 2k plus 1 over 10. Great. And again, that's from taking that sum. And now let's observe that the sum index is a p, and this first and third term are independent of p. So that means if we add up all of those terms, we simply get, well, the number of terms in our sum times, well, whatever those terms are. So that's a nice simplification. So that means all we have to worry about is this magenta underline, this 2p term. So let's see what that gives us. I'll bring this constant down in front, uh, 10r minus one, 2n plus one, those are in the denominator. And then I'm adding this first purple underlined term to itself, 10 to the r times, because I'm summing from zero to that 10 to the r minus one minus one, sorry, 10 to the r minus one times. So that'll give us two times 10 to the two r minus two times n. Then I'm doing the same kind of thing with that two k plus one over 10 thing. So that'll give me two k plus one times 10 to the r minus two, taking it into account that I've got that 10 in the denominator. And then using the standard rule for um, a triangular number, which is essentially what we get adding up this 2p type term. So that's going to give us something like 10 to the r minus 1 times 10 to the r minus 1 minus 1. Again, that's the rule for the sum of a triangular number. And then from there, we've got some pretty straightforward calculation, and that leaves us with the following expression. 2 times n times 10 to the r, and then plus 2k plus 10 to the r minus nine, all over 10 to the r plus one times 2n plus one. Now, I think maybe the interesting thing here is for every choice of n and every choice of r, thinking about this as a function of k, this is always an increasing function of k, given the fact that we've got, well, this plus 2k term. It's actually kind of linear in k, linear with a positive slope. That means that all of the time, it's more likely to have nine as a digit in an expansion of a square root of x than it is eight, and that's more likely than seven, and so on and so forth, which is a pretty strange result, I think. Okay, so let's finish this with a little example of some actual probability calculation. As a concrete example, let's say that x is between 1 and 4, and we want to find the probability that the third digit of the square root of x is k. 
So putting that all into our calculation, we get that that probability is 2K plus 2,991 over 30,000. So then you can make a chart from that pretty easily and you get some interesting results. So notice the probability that K is zero is 0 0.0997. The probability that, for example, K is four is 0 0.0997. And then the probability that K is nine is 0 0.1003. So of course, like the difference between these probabilities is not large. Like in the grand scheme of things, it is almost equally probable that the third digit is any of these digits. But in fact, almost is the key word there. Because in fact, as we've seen, it is not equally likely for any digit to be a, a certain number. And that's a good place to stop.